friends, today we gather to mourn the loss of our beloved game genre, the MMO. You had a good run, but like the point and click adventure, your quest has ended. Ashbringer to Ashbringer, Enchanted Dust to Enchanted Dust. <gasps> it's alive! Hello, Internet! Welcome to Game Theory, where MMO stands for Matt Mouth's Opinions. Now, Game of War recently contacted me to talk about their game, and honestly, at first, I didn't know what to say. But as I thought about it, Game of War, and lots of other freemium games for that matter, represent an evolution in gaming we may not currently be playing, but we also shouldn't be ignoring. In part because of its impact on gaming as a whole, but also because freemium games promise to preserve one of gaming's oldest and most beloved of its genres, MMOs, just as it was on its last legs. And that's no PR spin. Looking at the history of gaming, the evidence is obvious. Lately, news about MMOs has been kind of a downer. Earl, if you could, uh, scroll through some search results here. Over the last year, more and more gaming publications have been discussing the death of the massive multiplayer online genre. The Lord of the Rings MMO? Gone. Elder Scrolls Online? Largely underwhelmed. The Star Wars MMO? I mean, Star Wars! The universe every single person on the planet it wishes they lived in and single-handedly got people excited to watch other people unbox toys for 18 hours straight. Nope, the SWOTOR. S SWOTOR? Is that right? S SWOTOR? SWOTOR. Maybe it was the acronym that was the problem here, guys. The SWOTOR has struggled since just a few months after it came out. Even Blizzard is making big moves, canceling Titan, their big Warcraft follow-up, after seven years of development, and their subscriptions for WoW are at their lowest since 2005. What happened to all the super successful MMOs where people literally lost decades of their life trading stacks of lizard skins for wheels of cheese? Are we entombing the MMO beside other dying genres like the rail shooter? Well, before you stuff that nether weave bag into the closet for good, there is a future for these games. MMOs aren't dying, they're evolving. So today we're exploring the history of the MMO and discussing how Game of War is just the new model for one of gaming's oldest genres. Now, a game genre evolving with the time is nothing new, but the MMO is such an old game style that none of us really realize how many changes it's already had. So much so that if you went back and looked at where they started, the MMO is practically unrecognizable. I would expect most people watching this channel didn't start to hear about the MMO until their former best friend, co-worker, or prom date fell victim to the World of Warcraft phenomenon. And if you're really ancient, like, say, 30, you might remember EverQuest and Neverwinter Nights. But the first true MMOs looked more like MS. DOS. If you've ever accidentally ended up on the command prompt screen of your computer, that was basically it. <laughs> And people complained that Elder Scrolls Online had lackluster graphics. Players would start a game and receive all the information about who their character was, what class they were, who their enemies were, everything over text. This was 1978, literally known as the Age of Mud, or multi-user dungeons, where all the players took turns entering in commands for the game to execute, kind of like a digital version of Dungeons and Dragons. In fact, some of the first MUDs, like Adventure, actually had lots of inside jokes and memes from tabletop gaming specifically included for D&D fans. But, like I said, this was 1978, years before America Online started sending free 100-minute internet sample CDs in the mail. Anyone remember that bizarre time? Came in that little box case that they sent in the mail? It's crazy. In fact, in 1978, the word internet had only just come into existence four years earlier, and still wasn't in mainstream usage. So how could players fulfill the online portion of MMO? Well, players gamed together through something called ARPANET which began as a pre-internet computer network only available at a few universities like MIT and Essex in the UK. Fun fact, ARPANET wasn't turned on all the time, which meant that if college kids wanted to play MUDs, they had to play when ARPANET was available, between 2 a.m. and 8 a.m. and on the weekends. So the reputation of MMO players gaming all night in a dark room? That wasn't antisocial personality disorder. It was literally the only time when the game was available. Because of how dedicated players had to be to even 
and be a part of these games, the name Mud was also jokingly called the multi-undergraduate destroyer because it would ruin college kids' lives trying to play it. Which is funny, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Also, some of the games, like Oubliette, literally couldn't be played by one person, so you needed what was known as a dungeon party to even survive the game. Oh, you thought those were a wow thing? The tropes of this genre have literally been around for nearly 40 years. So needless to say, early MMOs had some drawbacks. Beyond the less than thrilling gameplay style and late night play sessions, another issue was the cost. Once the internet officially became a thing at the end of the 1970s, the only internet company was Telenet, where you paid for internet access by the hour and by the distance the information had to travel. To have my avatar, Maddie Patty one in LA, fire an arrow at Gerard Completionist at his office in Orange County, it would cost me literally $7 an hour just to have access to the internet. But there were also long distance internet charges added to that, making it ridiculously expensive to play with people on the other side of the country. Fast forward to 1985. Never gonna give you where some of the first G muds or graphical muds came out that actually had basic images and pictures. Mind blown. But with moving images came the need for more data and the first appearance of an MMO staple, the subscription fee. The early internet service providers like CompuServe would actually partner with these games, enticing more people to use their service, then charge players to be a part of them. And we're not talking the standard $15 a month, we're talking between $6 and $12 per hour depending on the connection speed you wanted, which allowed you to input, get this, one command every 10 seconds. Let me translate that. That's 360 moves for $12 or 3 cents per move. When you put it that way, it really makes you value every examining and walking command. For most of the 80s, you had to subscribe to a specific internet service provider to play an MMO, and the first unlimited monthly subscription game, Shadow of Euserbius, cost, I kid you not, 100 and $19 a month to play. Can't imagine why we don't hear about that one anymore. So why am I talking about all this? Well first, because I think the early days of video gaming is fascinating. But more importantly, even back then, players were worried the MMO genre would die. People weren't too happy having to pay $120 per month for their favorite games. I can't imagine why. And they feared that the high cost would kill all the game subscribers. A valid concern. So the developers of MMOs started looking for ways to make it easier for players to play. Fast forward to the 1990s by then you have multiple ISPs offering more MMOs, like Neverwinter Nights, with actual graphics instead of just pictures and text. The games also had dedicated servers, which could help hundreds or thousands of players play at the same time. But best of all, with MMOs unstuck from internet service providers, the price to play also dropped to basically where it's been for the last 10 years, about $15 per month, with the occasional expansion pack thrown in for good measure. At the time, it was way better than any model that had come out before, and it literally let millions of new players try an MMO when before they couldn't afford it. So, going back to our original question then, why do MMOs seem to be dying out now? The system has been working for years. Well, like I said, the price to play the games has been pretty much the same for more than a decade, but the cost to make the games hasn't. Let's go back to our friend Swart. Swats. Swoter. Whatever. Star Wars. Star Wars was developed by Bioware, the same publisher as Neverwinter Nights. Clearly a company who knows what they're doing with an MMO. Well, the game costs nearly $200 million to make, making it the fourth most expensive game ever made. How about Destiny, the MMO FPS? It is the most expensive game ever made at $500 million. Disney Infinity, also in the top list with $100 million. In creating an MMO, devs are expected to create a vast world that feels alive and open-ended, always changing. But by spending that much to make a game, you take a huge risk. The risk that, you know, people just might not like it. And it's not like any of the MMOs mentioned here aren't fun games. Most are pretty good. Some are fantastic. But the problem is that they need so many people to play for such a long time just to break even that it's almost impossible to become a smash hit. In the case of Swator, what was supposed to be the next World of Warcraft breakout hit actually just ended up slashing their subscription fees. As EA's CEO recently stated, quote, the message from players exiting the game 
game is clear. 40% say they were turned off by the monthly subscription. Man, doesn't it suck when we have to pay for things? Why can't we just get vast open worlds offering thousands of hours of entertainment for the low cost of, I don't know, free? Why can't EA simply be happy with the payment of a job well done and millions of pleased fans? Well, hate to break it to you guys, but artistic satisfaction and lollipops ain't keeping the lights on at these places. So how can MMOs be financially feasible now? EA actually had more to say. Many players indicate they would come back if we offer a free-to-play model. Ah, and here we see history repeating itself. Way back in the early 90s, players demanded MMOs that weren't tied to their ISPs and cost less than $100 a month to play. So developers listened. And what seems like this huge MMO crisis now is just gamers dealing with a new issue, subscription fatigue. I mean, think about it. You have to pay a subscription fee for internet, for Netflix, Spotify. Maybe you're paying someone on Twitch or Patreon. That's like a million subscriptions. But we live in an age where there's another alternative, free to play. Gamers treat F2P like it's a dirty word. Uh, acronym. Uh, letter, number, combination. And yet this is clearly a model we want. I'm not just talking about what EA said. The numbers themselves don't lie. Look at this data. For all our moaning and groaning about free to play, the charts speak for themselves. We're far more likely to try a game if it's free than if it costs even something like 99 cents. People today want games that they can try before they buy or can invest as much as they feel comfortable with. Even the big mega MMOs like World of Warcraft have started offering in-game transactions instead of charging players to play the first 20 levels. But it's mobile where the future of MMOs truly lie. I mean, look at the success of Nintendo handhelds. And with smartphones becoming more ubiquitous and with data rates going down and graphical ability of these devices going up, hardcore gaming on your cell phone or tablet is going to become the norm. To really see this, let's look at Game of War. Which, you have to admit, for a branded video, they've allowed me to talk about a lot of other stuff this whole time. So, good on you guys. It still has a lot of roots in the oldest part of the genre, focusing on real-time PvP action, trying to develop a city without it being destroyed by someone else's alliance. Like the dungeon parties of Oubliette, where you couldn't play, let alone win, if you were going solo, forming alliances with people from around the world is essential in Game of War, to fend off attackers when you need to take some time off. But it takes the MMO formula and then begins to evolve it. Suddenly, you're literally living in a living, changing world because the game distributes content in real time with no need to download patches or updates. Servers are no longer segregated by language like most other MMOs because engaging with people from across the globe is possible through an in-game crowdsourced translator. And because it's accessible, millions of people are playing these games, from the casuals to the hardcore, whether or not they want to admit it. And instead of having to commit days in front of a tricked out computer, it comes with you to be played in short bursts, which is exactly how we consume content nowadays. So the next time you see an article about the death of the MMO, remember, you know better. The MMO isn't going anywhere. In fact, it's probably the most resilient gaming genre out there. It's just entering the next phase of its life. Is a free-to-play system perfect? <laughs> no, of course not. But spoiler alert, anytime you ask people to pay for anything, they're gonna be upset. Seriously, free-to-play, pay-to-play, people complain regardless. There is no winning. But for a game genre that needs to cater to literally millions of people, offering a living, breathing, evolving world, the financial model that Game of War represents is one that people seem to prefer over subscriptions for another few years until they ask the genre to change again. Who knows, maybe we'll be in a moneyless society by then. Let's make the deal now. Trade you a beaver for that wheel of cheese. But hey, that's just a theory. A game theory. Thanks for watching.